want you to join me on a journey to Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is uh, the largest lake in Africa and the second largest freshwater lake in the world. The lake is shared by three countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. I was born and raised around this lake in a small town. Now it is uh, it's, it's relatively big now, somewhere just a few kilometers uh, between the Kenya-Tanzania uh, boundary. As I was growing up, up around this lake, something spectacular used to take place every night, every time when it was dark. Suddenly, in the middle of the lake, you'd start seeing lights appearing one after another in various parts of the lake until you'd see um, a large mass of sparkling lights, beautiful lights, joys to the heart. It, as children growing uh, around this lake, we used to play you know, our, uh, our children games, predicting where the next light would come from. It was nice to watch. Of course, we didn't really understand what these lights meant in terms of life with so many people. As we grew up, we came to understand what these lights meant. It was how fishermen caught one small fish, which is called daga. The technology is not unique uh, to Lake Victoria. It is practiced in so many different places around Africa, in several inland lakes, even in some of the coastal uh, ar around the seas. It's a simple thing. What normally takes place is fishermen would normally put lamps, kerosene lamps, on floating pieces of wood. These lamps, as, as the light shines, they would attract fish. And as the fish came, then the fishermen would encycle it and scoop out the fish, put in their boats. They would make, do that a number of times. When it's enough, some, most, most of the time in the morning, they would take it out to go and sell. Sometimes there was a lot of fish, so they would go, in the, uh, let's say like at dawn, and still come back and get more of it. it was alive with so many people. It is, it is simple to talk about it like this, but for fishermen and this, this thing, there's a lot of art that goes into it, patient skills to be able to know, you know, how much fish, for example, what time should I actually put my nets to be able to get the fish? So it is, it's an art for the fishermen. This fish called daga is, is, is a small fish. Um, it is, it's not like, um, uh, you know, the babies of the big fish that uh, we, we always do not want to be caught, we, the ones which are immature. These are fish that in their life cycle, at maturity, they are small, sometimes 5, 10, 20 centimeters. They are okay to catch, and there are thousands of them across Africa, different species, different names. Um, actually, out of every three kilograms of fish that is caught in Africa, two of them will be this kind of, of small fish. They are what actually sustains much of Africa's fisheries. But something happens about this fish. For every three kilograms of fish, this small fish, or these different types of small fish that is caught, one, one kilogram gets spoiled. It doesn't reach the consumer. When a fisherman goes to fish overnight and brings the fish in the morning, his intention is that this fish is actually going to feed someone but out of the three kilograms that a fisherman catches, one gets spoiled and does not reach the consumer. Let's, let's, let's just take a moment to think about this. Let, let's forget about fish for a while. Let's, let's take something that we know. Let's talk about beef, for example, because we know what it means to many of us. Assume that every three kilograms of beef that leaves the abattoir, that one gets spoiled, does not reach the consumer. Wouldn't it raise a national outcry would the ministers of agriculture sit down and call crisis meetings and say, what can we do about it? Yet, in fisheries, this is something that has happened for so many years. It happens today as 10 years ago, as 20 years ago, and the world has not paid attention. Every year, we are losing nearly 2 million tons of fish getting spoiled of these small fish. Now, why does this happen? Last month, I visited uh, one of um, the fishing villages that I used to visit some time back. In the last few years, I've been working in different countries, so I've really not had a chance to pay a lot of attention. But I decided to go there and 
just find out what's happening. So I met this nice woman called Celestine. Celestine is a wonderful woman, unusual, because Celestine has a boat. Not many women actually own boats, but she owns a boat. So she took me you know, through her fishing system. There the boat had brought fish. Normally there would be a compartment where they have fish. It was somewhere between half full and three quarters full. Not unusual in November, uh, they would have that. If it was March or April when there's a lot of rain, the boat would actually be full with the fish. Sometimes, you know, it would have brought fish and gone back and brought a second, a second consignment. But she had the fish. It was, you know, shiny, sparkling, daga, very beautiful to watch. And she told me, look, this fish is here. It is fresh, it's okay. And um, from here, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to spread a net here, covering, you know, something like almost 100 meters by 100 meters, and then I would dry the fish here on the ground. It was not abnormal. That's what they do every day. And there are several, almost 40 women doing the same thing. Then I would have to sit here for eight hours waiting for this fish to dry. Today is a good day. You can see the sun is, uh, you know, it's a bright sky. So, th so there's no problem. At the end of the day, Celestine was going to sell her fish and get something like uh, $4, $4, sometimes $5, when it is dry. In the rainy season, March, April, May, when there's a lot of fish, the price would probably go slightly lower, probably $3. But that time, a lot of fish would get spoiled. If it rains at any time throughout the year and Celestine has her fish, she can lose everything, and she, they do lose everything. Now, Celestine, of course, so I was getting depressed. She told me, oh, don't worry. I mean, even if it gets spoiled, you know, some people would normally still come and buy it for, for cheap, uh, chicken feed or, you know, animal feed. But I said, now, how much do you get? She told me, okay, we would get something like maybe one dollar, probably half a dollar. So, look at it. The difference between Celestine selling her good, I mean, her well-dried fish and Celestine selling her spoiled fish is almost a loss of 80% of her income. Now, Celestine is just one woman. There are 10 million women selling, processing, and selling these small fish in Africa. And all of them are incurring these same problems that Celestine is facing. Now, that's just one, one part of the story. The other part is what this fish means to so many people. The small fish are some of the most nutritious fish that actually somebody can have. Normally they are eaten whole, with the bones, with all parts. So somebody gets, I would say, a full dose of all that there is in this fish. This fish is rich in vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin D. This fish is rich in calcium, is rich in iron, zinc, phosphate, all these things. Actually, 150 grams of the small fish is enough to provide about 60% of the daily protein requirement for a growing person. And especially for children, we've known that if a child is, gets access to um, this small fish, within the first 1,000 1, days, we are talking about maybe from uh, the beginning of pre pregnancy to the first two years, actually this has a very big impact in terms of the development of the brain. So this is a fish that actually makes a lot of difference to so many people. I talked about the 10 million people who are employed in fish processing and, 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 and marketing. There are about 3 million people who are actually also involved in fishing in Africa. So you can imagine the impact of this fish. Yet, we have sat and actually accepted that it, should, it can actually get spoiled all through uh, you know, these years. Is there something that actually we can do? Again, listening to what Celestine was telling me, I was able to pick up some things. Celestine is asking for a technology. Can we be able to have a technology that actually can help Celestine to dry her fish in her one hour? Can we have a technology that actually Celestine does not need to pray every morning that God, please, may it not rain, otherwise my children will grow hungry. Don't we have this technology? Don't we have the skills? Don't we have the resources in this world, 
in 20, 21st century to be able to help Celestine. We talk about solar, and we're able to package solar technology in a way that actually can help Celestine. I believe we can. I believe we have the skills. I believe we have the resources. It's only that we have not really paid attention uh, to what Celestine and 10 million other women actually are asking for. I also mentioned about Celestine's lamps and the beautiful lights you know, that shine this lake. Now, these are based on, they use kerosene, a petroleum product. In one year, on Lake Victoria alone, we actually use two million liters of kerosene to light you know, this side so that it can attract fish. Do we really need, in 21st century, to, uh, to, to put such, I mean, so much uh, petroleum products in the environment on the lake to catch the fish? Can solar work for us? I believe that actually we have the skills and the technology to change this. Now, something else about this fish. Over time, it has had a connotation of poverty, that it is meant for poor people. And in many uh, areas where I've gone, in urban areas where people put on ties and work in offices, many of you know, the middle class people would normally not want to be associated with this. Yet it is the fish that actually makes a lot in terms of nutrition. So, I think there's a message here. One thing is that we need the policy makers to understand that there's a resource here that we are really not paying attention to and where actually we can make a lot of difference. What we need is resources in terms of infrastructure, pay attention to technology, and also pass this message to the middle class and the rest of the people. You know that here is a fish that actually can, they can ben benefit a lot in terms of nutrition. Ultimately, if we are going to reduce poverty through fisheries in Africa, we have to pay attention to the small fish. There's no way where we are going to develop this without this being at the center of our strategies. Thank you.